We are here with Sridhar Rembu. It's my ultimate pleasure to introduce uh, one of India's very, very iconic entrepreneur. Uh, he's an entrepreneur in a very unique sense. He's done things very differently uh, from what a typical VC-funded uh, entrepreneurs and ecosystem has been doing that we have all heard about. So, uh, so firstly, I would like to ask you, Sridhar, well, just tell us about your journey uh, and uh, I think many people know it, but not everybody knows it. So, so well, uh, well, uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Um, uh, ours is really primarily a journey of, let's say, India's emergence in of more complex technology driven products because we are in software. But this is our long-standing conviction for more than 25 years that we must be a strong player in all the critical technologies. And I only pick software because it's easier to get into without a lot of money. But we must be there in aircraft engines to robotics to AI to all of it. So, and uh, so we are part of that. I, I think of it the technology nation building. So that's the journey of Zoho. And we still have a long way to go. I mean, we are, we are at a good midpoint stage, but I think we still have another 25 years to, to go in, in a lot of, to achieve the objectives that I want to achieve. But so that's where we are. So one thing Caesar is very famous for is modesty. So when he says midpoint, uh, most startups, etc., will think, okay, you know, you've made like some $5 million of revenue, but he's like, it's like a multi-billion dollar company that he's created. Um, and, and created in a very unique way. Uh, maybe Shri, you can touch on that a little bit because not everybody says, you know, I'll go to Tenkasi and, and build a company there. Yeah, that also is part of our, um, see, we are a vast nation, 1.4 billion people. There are 833 districts. And to put that in perspective, each district is, you know, an average more populous than the nation of Estonia. <laughs> okay. And many of our districts will drive well, say, even uh, Finland. For example, some of our districts. Which has built so these are nice and Nokia. Yeah, these are yeah, yeah. And so uh, Finland is famous for Nokia. Estonia is actually an advanced digital nation now. And and that's about the size of a Tenkasi district in terms of population. So take a random pin on the map of India. Uh, you draw a fifty kilometer circle, you're going to find half a million people, maybe a million people. So that's why I think uh, we and we should develop all the talent. Today, development means like Bangalore or Chennai or Hyderabad and, you know, Gurgaon and Mumbai, all these ecosystems, but Pune. But what about uh, Tenkasi and districts like that? So, and there is talent there. And the solution to the talent is you, let's, well, let's bring them to Bangalore. And I don't think that's a good solution, even for... Thank I don't you. think, I don't think you should have, you should double the population here. We are already, what, uh, 14, 15 million people. I don't know that Bangalore wants to become 25, 30 million people. Or Chennai not wanting to become 30 million, 25 million people. It doesn't make sense. So that's why I think we have to think different. And, and our company is part of that thinking different. Thinking different. <laughs> I mean, and I think it's uh, truly interesting for somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to pick this million people and make them uh, as good as Estonia and build the next Skype from here. I mean, that's a very, very bold mission. So one thing that... Uh, I would like to sort of start with, because uh, we ask people plus AI, we're focused on AI's <laughs> impact on India. While everybody is talking about AI and can't seem to stop talking about AI, um, you have said that, uh, you know, th this might be a bubble. Um, in what sense of that word uh, do you mean bubble? Uh, there is, of course, a real part. I mean, AI, we have made huge leaps of progress. There's also the bubble in the sense... Uh, a lot of VC money going into fairly questionable ideas or sometimes there's no technology behind it and uh, it's just a business plan they're going to do something related to AI that's a classic bubble you know when you don't actually know what they're going to do and then those things maybe should be funded off a million dollars million dollars but they're funding the 100 million dollars <laughs> so that's what the bubble part of it is but having said that the, uh, the technology itself has some, some things we have to figure out for example, how to put this to use in a accurate way so that uh, it doesn't make like the hallucination problems one. Second, specific domains, regulated domains, how are you going to ensure privacy and of course the the 
confidentiality of data that's put in and because the models can leak data because the models are kind of memorizing the training data and sometimes they memorize and regurgitate from the response you can kind of figure out where the data would have come from that's a dangerous mm. thing to do because we don't have full control of the model we don't have and so what they memorize mm. what the weights mean right we don't know what the weights mean so that's why i think those problems are to be solved in all this so i i am a, a domain specific uh, approach is my approach in this you apply it to narrow domains show real tangible benefit to the customer specific use cases it could be lawyers uh, it could be doctors it could be real estate agents whatever but apply that smaller models will help those are cheap to run often they can run on your laptop or you, even on your phone with all them to kind of chips so that's why i think that's where i think the low hanging fruit is that's what i would focus on while keep an eye on the foundations how the foundations are changing to answer these broader questions fascinating and i know that um, you have uh, your focus on software you personally are actually hands on yeah. doing something so i want to uh, i'm going to come to that in a second but just to close out on the topic of the bubble because there is a big debate going on is it a bubble or not uh and having personally myself started a company in the dot com bubble and seen the bubble burst um but in the internet era and and you are a beneficiary of it as i was uh where there was something real internet is real obviously nobody is going to question it now but the valuations of you know puppet dot com or socks dot com was obviously way over value so the vc money were valued a, a, a real thing maybe by a factor of 100 but then the bubble burst and useful things came out of it um but for example the one contrast we are drawing is to crypto so in crypto uh, you know a lot of money also went in it's unclear what is going to come out of it how would you contrast the internet bubble a dot com bubble a crypto bubble and an ai bubble yeah so this is more like the internet where it's definitely useful it's definitely will have an impact but the over valuation itself often destroys companies it's not like a, a particular company could not have succeeded if they held out long term but when lots of money was thrown at them they kind of destroyed their own culture and uh, their way of operating and their you know uh, ability to think in business fundamentals if they have to conserve cash that goes out the window and that's why the company stayed so in a way you know if, in other words a company that may may have been funded only 2 million may have survived the bubble and the bust but when just throw 200 million at them they don't some money and ruin them they are just ruined them exactly so that's a that's uh, that's repeated many times over so even in a long term good industry you want to pace yourself correctly you don't want to go overspend at the front with the expectation that there will be a huge immediate reward because that's what gets dashed that the rewards are not within the next 2 3 or 4 years it might happen after 10 15 years that patients people who don't have the patience should be careful investing in this so that's the the real message to investors of this and the same thing with the expectations of technologies was the short run we overestimate technology in the long run we underestimate it right and then that's a, that's a famous quote i think bill gates said it and uh, it's true i've noticed that it's true that we might think that in 3 5 years we'll make a big revolution it doesn't but take in india on the internet from 2000 to look at 2023 huge impact to our payment system to all of it completely transform but we didn't happen in 2004 on mm-hmm. 5 or 6 it had to wait those 20 year 15 20 and this stage is period i think that is applicable to a lot of technology including ai including yeah. ai that's a super nuanced point uh the point is it's like you know don't play the short game yeah. right if you are willing to play the long game Yeah. there is gold in this provided you are not over capitalized and over valued just pace yourself you are not and, and the gold in the long term also may not be where you are initially digging mm-hmm. so when you give yourself the patience you can you know in the modern parlance you can pivot and go dig somewhere mm-hmm. else mm-hmm. but you'll learn something about digging for gold <laughs> so you can apply it somewhere else and maybe you will strike gold there yeah, absolutely and uh, i think i heard you give a very interesting uh, analogy of uh, uh, autonomous vehicles where you know a lot of people kept making promises yes um and i think your point is the not the mistake the mistake wasn't making promises not like the yeah. engineers actually so yeah, the, uh, the, definitely they will happen 
all the problems will be worked out. But by the time it happens, it will be kind of unsexy. Okay, we always anticipate that, right? But you have to, in order to really keep your wonder, you have to think in terms of what it was without any kind of self-driving and then the full self-driving. That is how it happened in very small step, maybe step at a time. That patience is what we need to to really stay the long, play the long game, play the long game. That's fascinating, but Sridhar, it's also your personality, I think, to understand, go first principles. Yeah. Uh, I know you're doing this in EV and, you know, and electric motors and a number of other areas. Um, but uh, what I want to dig in on is in AI and Zoho and you personally. Um, you talked about, you said, hey, I'm not going to solve the world's problem, but I'm going to pick a problem. Programming is, I think, one thing that you said. Love to double click on that. Like, what are you doing? What do you see the improvement in programming? You said it's a low-hanging fruit. So, uh, as I mentioned, the 80% of the programming is a creative job, but 80% of the tasks we do are not creative. There's a lot of mundane work, shuffling dead are all mentioned. I call it uh, really like a bookkeeper's job. You are shuffling dead are all between this and that, keeping track of it all there. Tools can actually do a better job than humans can do. Keeping track of uh, variables, not losing memory, these kinds of jobs. And uh, there could be major advances in those areas. Correctness, for example. There's a lot of uh, type system work, proof theory, all of that, that now ensure more correct programs by design. And this is applicable not just to business applications, but even could be embedded, all of them. Where a program is correct by design. You can certify that it's correct by design. These things raise the productivity. Because a lot of effort is goes into testing and debugging, chasing down bugs after they occur. A lot of the grunt work can be avoided if you paint the, the if you use the proper tooling up front, if you build the proper tooling, all of that. So that's where that I think the productivity can be massively improved. It requires better languages, tools, compilers, and AI systems, code generators, all of the above. And that's where my own personal focus is. I'm looking at all of the aspects of it. What do you see the, uh, so far uh, in the journey? It's been whatever, eight months, one year since the large language models became popular. What is the gain that you're seeing in terms of programmer productivity? Uh, these are now in the 10, 20%, 10, 20%. Kind of range right now. But the potential is enormous. So I'm thinking like 4, 5x. I'm not thinking 20%. 4, 5x. Yeah, what time? Yeah, yeah. That, again, the time frame. This is where, like five years. Uh, like I don't want to be the, okay. again, make the sin driving mistake and tell you in five years, programmers will be five times productive. But I can tell you that the glimpse of it is there. Okay. And I can see it. But again, a lot of this, you know, when you go down to the brass tacks, you work on it, you'll realize you come into a, you hit a new roadblock. It's always the engineer's work, right? And then you have to spend countless hours, countless days, months, mm -hmm. sometimes, or sometimes years to solve the problem. That's what has happened in self driving, right? You solve all the easy ones, mm -hmm. then the difficult problems will be very, very difficult. <laughs> and this could happen with programming, but my own rough estimate is you can easily get that four, five fold gain in front of you. So, and, and, the, and the AB is actually a good, uh, good metaphor for this. Because just like in automated way, you know, we might not have a fully self-driving car, but even today in almost every car, there's a lot of important things that like the computers do do for you. And you're still the pilot. Do you see sort of see that as the model? Yes. So there'll be the programmer who's the pilot uh, who's responsible for it, but much more productive. The average programmer becomes much more productive because the tools are doing a lot of the grunt work. And that includes you know, the build system, setting up, coming up with automated test cases, validating every thing you do, a lot of the cross-checking the work that would have required a human reviewer. Maybe a system can cross-check your work. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. No, perfect. Um, Sridhar, you also mentioned you're building your own models. Why build a foundational model? There are so many already there. We are using existing models, enhancing them. We are also the new models. I mentioned it as a the longer term R&D effort because we have to gain mastery of the technology. In any of this is true, whether it's a compiler, whether it's an operating system, whether it's a database or LLM. My own predilection as an engineer. See, I'm I thought this whole you know in uh, typical uh, MBA circles, the not invented here is pejorative. Mm -hmm. To me, the not invented here is a very important concept I use. Not invented here is a goal. Yeah, that is, I, I say, if it's not invented here, we should be careful not using it, <laughs> right? So, you know, there's a, 
you know this how it's pejorative for 20 years yes that's to me the jack welch kind of school of management i reject those i reject all those schools so that's why i built our own company because i reject those schools of management <laughs> so the the it's an engineers company we build stuff and we are here to build stuff so and so we have to build our foundation model the same reason why they climb mount everest because it's there <laughs> <laughs> that's a good answer yeah um and look if anybody has uh, actually shown that this nih and all these mba terms uh, you know need not apply uh, yeah. it's you uh, you've done it and shown is a real world business not some you know a theoretical professor sitting in a in a university tinkering with stuff because real world you make money and that's like no better proof than that uh, you know uh, the, and everybody should be humbled by that um but uh, just it, but on that point of not in medical just just zooming out a little bit from zoho to india um you pioneered the made in india for the world i mean no better example than zoho honestly do you see do you see the potential for that in ai definitely we have see the the if we focus on foundations we first we have to do the tactical plowing fruit pick that that's you know you talked about the money part there's a lot of small problems you can solve that make us money that's true for any indian startup and but keep the focus on the long haul where you are also investing in the foundations foundational r&d so it's sort of a, the, there's a variation of uh, think globally act locally think long term but act for short term too so your short term orientation is how do we uh, feed our long term vision how do we come up with resources for the long term investments so that's the that's the way i operate i'm definitely focused on quarter to quarter we have to have revenue on that but i also know that 10 years down the road how do we stay relevant in this industry that's where the foundation in all this other investments are going yeah. so um so touching on this in terms of the i guess the, the problem of ai and that people plus ai our focus is on what ai is going to do for india what do you think ai can do for india um in healthcare for example we have huge amounts of data and that uh, sharad mentioned this morning and that can be tapped for our benefit we have more data than anybody else in the world as our doctors see more patients than anybody else in the world in fact often our doctors become very very good because of the sheer amount of practice correct they have which already observed in many many industries law that we our operational you know the surgical procedures have a higher success rate and faster uh, on when because of the better practitioners here you mentioned something when i when i i i when i carry mention and the harvard business school professor uh, kash rangan mentioned to me that uh, how he rates them the best in the world wow okay best in the world in eye surgery so not just best in india best in the world so that is something that we can aspect in healthcare is a good example and the delivery because we you know there is a pressing need for this what they call the health tourism because the regulatory and all of that uh, particularly take us and care is so frightfully expensive so india can compete on that you know, get the patients here and take care of them well all of that because we have better practitioners and they i could help there that's what along with it then go back uh, vertical integration the medical equipment all of the hospital uh, equipment and and their ai is useful okay so again the practice clinical practice and the data and our software promise all of that came into play there so that's actually why i believe in medical equipment as a sector in india and then then goes one uh, one step remote the drug discovery all of it there are also there's a lot of ai involved so just the healthcare alone which if you look at uh, the advanced countries it's 15% of gdp now correct so that's a could be a very vital sector similarly transportation i think we could make major improvements in public transportation see for our density i'm a big believer in trains electric trains for example and there ai could be applied self driving trains to keep the cost down you know electric trains everywhere that super cheap cost it's actually fully automated mm-hmm. that could be done mm-hmm. so those are some of the areas that i would like mm-hmm. where we could have an edge simply because we know it works all of this is contextual innovation absolutely. it happens because we have a need for it of course us uh, absolutely fascinating um but in all of this also there is a little bit of a fear right like fear of losing jobs it's been happened before like when computers first came everybody thought they'll be out of a job more jobs got created thanks to thanks to people like you um 
is there a fear like that is this, is that real fear or no i i always look at this as a political economy question than a technology question <laughs> I'll, i'll do a thought experiment you know if you watch star trek you know the replicator yeah that's a device where you can go and say give me an iphone and give me an iphone and <laughs> i'll replicate one for you yeah. free right so imagine somebody invents that super device so imagine a device that will give you everything for free no jobs at all no one needs to do any work mm-hmm. so is that a bad thing well it's not a bad thing because you know air is free <laughs> and uh, still i think in many parts water is still <laughs> kind of free and we don't complain that air is free right so why i'm saying it is it's not that the job is whatever that we do to, for human serve each other mm-hmm. that's how i see a job mm-hmm. the fact that all of manufacturing is automated all of this is automated we'll find something else to do in in fact it could even be for example we have people who sing in temples that's a job yeah. or people who sing for kids that's a job mm-hmm. or people who take who sing for old people that's a job and those jobs could pay well mm-hmm. i mean i'm just saying we have to rethink what is a job you know and uh, if goods are free then these jobs pay well in the sense that they give you an entitlement to goods that are clearly free like uh, a temple singer could make enough money to buy iphone and everything mm-hmm. because what it means is the relative value of the iphone has shrunk <laughs> compared to the temple singing that's all it is right it's a political economy question that requires our political arrangements to be proper so that the fruits of all of this technological innovation can reach broad segment of the population some countries get this better right some countries don't and that's a gene coefficient inequality all of that and that's the political economy question fundamentally for example japan has been more egalitarian compared to the us correct and if you go to japan you see it right similarly sweden or uh, even germany would be more egalitarian than say us as a or brazil so that's really your political arrangements are not just this is not just a technology knowledge is yeah. fair enough um but i have a son in 12th standard and i'm sure many people are here who are going to be watching this video they have kids in colleges what would you what would you tell them like you know for for several decades now we're saying go study please study computer science get a job get a good job and your life will be all set what would you yeah, tell first tell them don't take any such gospel truth way <laughs> go study computer science go study this all that because that stuff will change so you want first and foremost the ability to think for yourself and for a young person today the biggest force is the peer pressure acting on them like i do something because all my friends are doing it and you want to have to no, most progress will come if you develop the habit of some original thinking or think from foundations or i say mathematically what are your assumptions state the assumptions then come with the conclusions sometimes question the assumptions well these are assumption why should that be an assumption question those that's the the thing i'll teach and then you will you know whatever way the world zigs for example you are going to have a lot of temple singing jobs <laughs> we can adapt ourselves for that you know absolutely and in any case regardless whether you do computer science or whatever it's good to have that uh, uh, artistic musical some passion that's not just all technology not just all money something personal yeah because that could prove to be the path to salvation <laughs> <man. laughs> absolutely and i do luckily see us uh, you know more and more evolving into having creative and other things exactly. also being respected honestly right. they didn't get respect when i was growing up um so one last question uh, you sort of alluded to this multiple times but if there are many entrepreneurs listening to this ai entrepreneurs everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon obviously you are a long term thinker but what would you tell them hey this is new we are at the ground stage of this next 20 years of ai how what should they do so yeah, if you are a small entrepreneur there is definitely money in helping larger companies figure this out so you be agile you figure it out then you help a larger company figure it out they may come and say a bank or maybe an insurance company or even a hospital chain may tell you hey all this stuff there's too much going on maybe we'll give you a contract to help figure this out which is a productized service or a serviceized product whatever that's a good way to build the new company you also learn the domain working with them then maybe some of the knowledge you productize and you sell to other people mm. 
So that's a great way to start building companies. Yeah. That's what I'd say. You know, that's a that's a excellent piece of advice. A number of entrepreneurs have been coming to me as well. And I'm saying something similar because there's a whole stigma of service companies and we'll yeah. become a service provider. But in this new area, uh, first of all, you can do service much more efficiently right. than it was before. Uh, you, sh- you should be able to do it. And companies need help. See, you are if the larger companies. Uh, you, know, you are a big hospital chain. They know hospitals, but they don't know all this AI, what is going on in LLM. They don't have people to figure this out. Correct. So if you go in with a proposal and they partner with you, that could be mutually beneficial. And you use that as a starting point and you have customers. So don't disdain that type of work. That's yeah. what I would say. That's fantastic. You both get customers and some cash flow going. Exactly. So that you can uh, then... You know, I, I tell you in business, uh, first and foremost, if you don't have cash flow, you're nobody in business. So... That's an excellent uh, line to end on, Sridhar. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.